All right, we're back. Uh, we took a couple of Tuesdays off for vacation, and uh, while we were off in Vegas, we we took a couple of weeks off. But we're back with the interviews, and I'm really to ha- uh, happy to have this next guy with us, the host of the New York City Crime Report, uh, Pat Dixon, uh, joining hey, us man, today. Hey, Pat. Uh, so it's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, no, it's great. We were just talking a little bit before, and I figured we had to hit start before we basically covered it all. Uh, <laughs> so here we are. Yeah, uh, point. I, I've no, I discovered uh, your show through uh, Compound Media. I think at the time, I don't know if they started as Compound Media, but like the first days of uh, Anthony leaving Opie and Anthony and starting his own thing, you were one of the you were one of the first guys he brought in. I got lucky because Louis J. Gomez, he was doing Legion of Skanks, uh, and and still is, but he was at Compound at the time. And I guess Jay Okerson was out. He just thought I'd be a great fit for the network, so he uh, introduced me, and that was that was kind of uh, where it went. I was I was kind of looking for something, uh, a place for the for the show to live, and and it was it's just a match made in heaven. I mean, uh, Kumi and Network at the time was uh, in no holds barred. Say anything you want, no interference whatsoever, and a whole new audience for me, really, because. I can guarantee there weren't that many people at Compound who were aware, or you know, Kumia Network at the time, who were aware of the the podcast I've been doing since like 2011. Right. Well, and being one of the first guys, I mean that that whole Compound thing, the way it came together in the early days. I mean, you were part of, I mean, a real murderer's row both then and now to see what those shows have become. I mean, you guys were. Anthony Cumia, a radio legend. You had Gavin McInnes, who you work for now, who's out of his fucking mind in the best way possible. Uh, you had the Legion of Skanks. I mean, before it blew up and he naturally um, made the whole thing implode, you had Red Bar for a little bit there. I mean, just a lot of different uh, real magnetic personalities in the, in the early days of, uh, of Compound. Yeah, I mean, I was proud to be a part of it, and I was proud to be a part of it until the the very end of my time there i really do appreciate the i mean it's a, it, first of all it's a great studio to work in very friendly the equipment's great of course and everything all that stuff just base level stuff but the people and the attitude it's always great yeah you know it's funny you mentioned red bar red bar does what he does and like that's fine but i i, I could tell that it was that bringing him in there was going to be an issue yeah and well, i told management i was like look this guy is you know, something's going to go wrong here, you know? And they were like, yeah, well, whatever. It'll make good radio. And when I say management, I'm not talking about Ant. You, right, so. yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, look, I've been a Red Bar fan for years. I can say this. I feel like this latest season, not to get too deep into the Red Bar weeds, has been a bit of a slog. And I think Mike, I don't know. I think Mike got too hooked into the gimmick of I have to hate everything. And, you know, I think that's kind of what happened with Compound, too. Like, I feel, I feel like... That really could have worked with all you guys, but yeah, he's almost like a kid where the more you tell him not to do something or the more you, you tell him you like him and he's being good, like the more he just feels the need to just hammer away at that thing. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, some people are just going to bite the hand that feeds them 100 times out of 100. That's fine if that's your thing. I thought that it was uh, going to cause problems. And, and when it did, you know, I mentioned it. Uh, but, I mean, it was <laughs> – I don't say I told you so without a reason. I mean, it was right. in, a, in a context. Yeah. At any rate, it, no, like you said, uh, everybody everybody at that time, it, it was uh, – you know, when Gavin was there, it, it was – it was truly, I mean, like you go in, he put in a lot of work. He'd be there afterwards, uh, you know, working on stuff, putting stuff together. And, you know, Gavin and I are about the same age. In fact, we're almost exactly the same age within like two weeks of being the same age. And uh, it just goes to show you how two people can spend uh, the same amount of time on earth and, and have so much, uh, so, so, so much different fortunes, you know, less to show for it, more to show for it. He's obviously, you know, done really well. I've done okay, but, like, uh, I, I never have uh, bothered to to budget out my, uh, my uh, well, yeah, I'm broke is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I, you, you, didn't, you didn't have the nice, uh, the nice vice payday either, so. Well, I mean, everything he touches turns to gold. That's the thing with Gavin. Everything that he touches... Like Proud Boys, when he invented that, it was just, uh, you know, it was just a joke. Yeah. It was just a fun joke. And then 
it became an international thing, and now I mean you can't pick up a newspaper today that doesn't have Proud Boys mentioned in it. And so it's it, it was surreal when that first started to happen because I watched the whole thing form. I, I remember and, I was watching Gavin's show one time, and he had this this writer from a Kentucky newspaper that like took. Uh, a Muri King or whatever his name is off some awards and I heard Gavin tell him he goes you gave the guy the award and then you took it back isn't that kind of playing n-word pool and the guy's face just lights up and then to think that like a year and a half later that same Gavin McInnes who was just asking weird questions on compound would be like the focus of FBI investigations is remarkable yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, I think it really shows that the demand for white supremacists and, and <laughs> alt-right groups really exceeds the supply, and they have to seize on something like, like Proud Boys. I mean, yeah. uh, about the silliest thing that... that that uh, you can that you can find really yeah five breakfast cereals all that stuff I mean right. it's a silly fraternity Proud Boys is something that like I imagine if Gavin came into the office it's something you could bust his balls about like oh really no sandals Gavin come on seriously yeah. and then it turns into like this oh my God it's the it's the militant wing of the of the MAGA movement and it's like guys I I watched the guy like fuck a butt plug on Compound Media I don't think he takes it that seriously. No. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you can we could debate like what people are capable of, you know, if led in the right direction. I, I never saw Gavin taking it that way. Like we're going to take this group and, you know, cause some sort of issue. We're going to yeah. attack people. We're going to beat up gays and blacks. And right. It, it was never that kind of thing. It really, it never went much further than across the street to Sullivan's to drink beer and just kind of watch sports and talk shit and, yeah. and you know, avoid women for, for an hour <laughs> or two. Well, I think that's the thing with, with Gavin in general is like he occupies this weird space where he started this thing, the Proud Boys, and that's how a lot of people got their introduction to him. So I don't, I don't, and then that was in a hyper-politicized time. I don't think his detractors had enough time to realize, oh, this guy's pretty much fucking around all the time. Well, his detractors, they don't care if he's just fucking around That's all the true time. Too. They they really all, all all the better for them. Yeah. It, it, look at a group like this the the I, I swear they must be affiliated with the feds. I, I forget what they're called, but American Front. I, I I don't I really don't remember. But you know, they wear the khakis, they look like they work at Blockbusters. Oh, the, the guys who got arrested in like Boston or something not too long ago? Yeah, they get everything they do yeah. is like this mass arrest and it's like conspiracy to, and like obviously there's people on the inside because I think the whole thing is on the inside. I, yeah. It's it's really silly. Uh, that's when they have to invent groups, you know, to go up against and like right. uh, what would those guys be doing otherwise, you know? I think my favorite one was the Justice for J6 rally that that pretty much the feds held in Washington. And there's, there's a clip of, like, two local cops who have arrested this guy who's dressed in, like, full Proud Boy, whatever that would look like, regalia. And they're questioning the guy. And the guy's an undercover fed. But the cops keep going, oh, oh, so you're with the federal government? And the guy's like, he, you can see him clenching his teeth. He's like, I, he literally says, quote, I'm just here. And the guy goes, oh, you're working? <laughs> and the guy's like, I'm just here. And then they escort the guy out of there. And it's it was the most embarrassing thing. But in today's climate, you can't show that to someone who believes the opposite of this is a Fed operation and convince them. They're just they're, they just you're a conspiracy theorist immediately. It's amazing, isn't it? How yeah. belief is so much stronger than hard facts, evidence, proof. Doesn't matter. Belief trumps all that stuff. Yeah. It's the the mind's capacity to just reject all information that conflicts with their with their inner core beliefs. It's it's fascinating, really. There should be a study about this time because it's it's yeah. nothing short of a mass psychosis, as uh, the doctors were saying about a year or two ago. Yeah, isn't it amazing too that also not taking a side or thinking that all sides are funny and you know available to mock that immediately puts you on team right wing i found that fascinating the last few years oh it, well yeah i mean you're either with them or you're against them and anybody with a sense of humor in my book is kind of like a default uh right winger you know because i never see anybody with any sense of humor on the left Right. I so mean, there's and it's so much more there to mock, too. I mean, there's so much more inconsistency. There's so much more, I don't know, uh, 
like you just said, this intolerance of anybody who doesn't go all the way down the line with them. And all you have to do is mess up once and you're out of the club. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. They are really brutal. And it's like they just hope to be eaten last. And so that <laughs> coerces them to go along with stuff that you can't imagine that they actually believe. Right. I mean, there's just to go. You're right. They've gone along with it for fear that, yeah, they'll, they'll the monster will get them next. And it is it's sad to watch because it's like, dude, why are you doing this? It's only a matter of time anyway. At least go out on your shield, you know? Yeah. Well, they're very uh, conflict averse, uh, ironically, yeah, because they don't feel any conflict when they are just like putting forth some other set of views. I mean. Like you said, you mentioned going out on your shield. It's like that's their shield is that, well, I don't really believe this stuff. This isn't <laughs> stuff I, I mean, this is just the, the party line. So yeah. they, they, they're they not really, they're, they're personally involved in a different way. They're just, they're very offended by anybody who makes their own choices about this stuff. Well, I mean, you do a show called New York, uh, New York City Crime Report. I mean, you've gotten to kind of see this breakdown an evolution in the best possible microchasm outside of maybe like San Francisco or Portland. I mean, you, you do a show that's kind of had New York City crime at its focus. I mean, I'm sure as the years go on, the show gets more and more interesting to do. Yeah, it does, really. It does. And uh, I have to say, there's always been weird crime in New York City because eight and a half million people, you cannot fail when they're compressed in that way to have interesting things happen. They're cinematic things. When you, when you look at them, you know, like a, a spree killer who attacks an innocent guy on a train and the guy ends up tackling him and taking his weapon away. And then the cops who were watching the whole thing happen, come up and say, we'll take it from here. <laughs> the guy nearly dies from losing all this blood. The right. cops stand by the guy takes, try, he wants to take them to court, you know, but he's not allowed to because of something called a special relationship that he didn't have. Well, I mean, just the fact that this happened, uh, but on the subway, the two train between, I guess, Penn station and times square, it, that's only a minute, you know, and it, you can see it happening in your head. That, that's why I started the show is because of stories like that. Actually that yeah. particular story, Joe Lazito, who, you know, this Maxime Gelman was about to make this guy his fifth victim of in, in 28 hours. You know I mean? The guy is all wow. drugged up. And, and, you know, Levy Aaron, who murdered a boy, you know, this was just some guy who was like super autistic, half retarded or something and was really into doing karaoke. Hootie and the Blowfish. <laughs> that was his favorite. Right. And Jesus. that was kind of all he did. He worked in a hardware store one day out of nowhere, abducts this boy, you know, gets him in his car, takes him home, feeds him poison, kills him and cuts him up, keeps the feed in the freezer, Jeez. and he's locked away for life. I mean, it's just like there's something just under the surface with a lot of people, and something about that environment in New York City seems to bring it bubbling up. New York City, like, what's happening crime-wise there and, like, the homeless population? I know it's across the country because, like, here in Minnesota, like, Minneapolis, is the same thing's happening. Like, we just had our state fair, which is supposed to be, like, the most wholesome, you know, uh, you know, Midwestern thing you could have. Uh, the last two nights, it was just two guys fighting and shooting each other uh, on both of the last two nights, like, even at, at, you know, at the fairgrounds. But, like, New York City is a weird one for me to watch. Because you guys have been through this and fixed it before. You guys are the ones who gave the whole country the blueprint on how to cut down on crime, get rid of the homeless people, make it good for like, you know, tourism, business, things like that. And it's almost like you guys, since kind of de Blasio, have just decided to let it go back to that. It doesn't seem like anyone's trying to stop it. Yeah, that shows how the left has truly run amok. We used to be able to, to agree on things like, safety in the streets that's a good thing sometimes you know it, it's not pleasant to look at because you have people you know stop and frisk was a big issue and the image everybody had was cops just throwing black guys against the wall and patting them down and looking for guns and all you know usually being wrong but they're just hassling innocent guys it's not really the way it was and in the 90s, people embraced that because they were so sick of the violence. But it has to go on for a long time yeah. before even the left, even at the time, could sort of catch up to the idea that we need to do what we need to do. Right. Everybody liked the results. 
course, some people bitched like, oh, you've taken the heart out of New York City. <laughs> yeah, but you could walk down 42nd Street without getting robbed. Yeah. It's, it's much, much better. And it was much, much better. Those were governors or not governors, excuse me, mayors of New York City, Giuliani and Bloomberg, who and, and thank God Bloomberg had that third term. I don't because there's no way that they were going to uh, elect another Republican mayor or conservative mayor or any, any sort of mayor who was going to going to take care of crime. So that was just three bonus years. I mean, this reversal really should have happened four years earlier than it did. De Blasio got in just by the fluke of Anthony Weiner yeah. fucking up, you know, in the way that he did. And he was basically the, the leading Democrat who wasn't a degenerate uh, or not an apparent degenerate, not a proven degenerate. Yeah. And and therefore he got to he got to be the mayor. And you're right. That's that is when the turnaround began. Yeah. And he, he's the worst mayor He's acknowledged to be the worst mayor that New York City's ever had, even among. Like, he didn't please anybody because no. he was just such a crook. So, yeah, <laughs> it, it turned around then, and, and we're on no... I mean, the first thing he started doing is reversing all the stuff that uh, that Giuliani did to clean it up. He started with the turnstiles, you know, the turnstile jumpers and the squeegee guys yeah. and taking a piss in the streets. And anything that they could do to get a, to get to be talking to somebody who might have a gun and then take the gun away from them. And then it starts to get around. These quality of life crimes are being enforced. And then uh, you start to have uh, this slow turnaround that you know results in going from over 2,000 murders down to around 300. Yeah. You got, yeah, I think it was like a big, it was a big story when you guys got under a murder a day. For a while there. And that was like a big celebration point. And I think even Le like Letterman was on at the time and he would have a countdown like, holy shit, there hasn't been a murder in New York City in X amount of days. And it was like it was really impressive. And that's what's kind of crazy about now is you guys have the playbook. Even your mayor now who says, uh, look, man, we need to get tough on crime. We need to get serious. Either he's not serious about it or the people in that city won't let him. You're there. I mean, I get you would know. Well, I'm not there currently. I uh, I ran out of money when I got fired from Compound. So oh. right now I'm in Pittsburgh, and I'm, I'm I don't even have a current residence. I'm just sort of going around from gig to gig, and and uh, you know doing, uh, so, you know, staying wherever in the meantime. But to your point, I have been following it there in New York City for fifth. I mean, I was there a long time, and reading about it now, so it's it's all I ever did. Keep in mind, all I ever did was read the news and then and then write jokes for it and talk about what I was seeing. So there's really no difference now, being there or not being there. But I will say this. He's not serious. Adams is not serious. He's He knows the rhetoric that needs to be said right now, so he's saying it. It's really obvious. People are sick of crime. It's, one of the, it's like at the top of the list of issues people are concerned about. So he pays a lip service and he does things like go to the governor or go to the assembly and say, hey, we need to do something about these about bail reform. We need to fix it. So, and, and they go, well, go fuck yourself. And he goes, great. And he, goes <laughs> back and he goes, I tried. All he does is kick it, you know, kick the can elsewhere and claim that he's that he's doing everything he can do. Of course, a mayor sets a tone. A mayor applies pressure if he wants yeah. to do things. There's things he can do. I mean, the. The uh, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, oh yeah, is, is absolutely a nightmare, and and he's ideologically aligned with that guy, and and it's all, all of his charging decisions are uh, they incorporate ideas of equity, race, and this is the way they do it now. I mean, it's actually in the instructions to the other, to the other, uh, well, to all the ADAs in Manhattan, yeah. and that sets the tone for the whole city. So, you know, I mean, he's full of shit, basically. And, and de Blasio even, you know, de Blasio was a rabble rouser in disguise. He would say, we, we understand you're going to want to protest and you feel a lot of pain. Please don't do any violence, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you sure. Guys, you yeah, guys were literally that's, just that's asking it. criminals to please not hurt people. Yeah, exactly. And, and saying, like, obviously, because of this, you know, when they didn't charge uh, the officer who, who was involved with Eric Garner down in Staten Island. Right. He goes, he, he basically said, obviously, you're going to riot about this. I mean, <laughs> obviously, you're going to come into the streets. 
you didn't say don't go into the streets. It goes just just don't do the violence. And it's like yeah. when you get, once that shit starts, violence happens. He knows right. that. Yeah. So he, he he's just the worst kind of Marxist uh, garbage, and that that's but you know to your point, um, saying that we have the playbook. Yes, we do. But a lot of revisionist history had to happen. You know, that all that stuff that they were doing in the meantime became racist. And it's not. It took on this, you know, there was a, a lawsuit and the judge, Shira Sheenlin, who agitated to get the case. That ended up getting her booted off. The decision was sort of in limbo. And de Blasio, as soon as he's elected, instead of fighting that, just goes, nope, we accept the terms of it yeah. 100%. And she was... She, she was she disqualified herself to even be on the case. So they had this activist judge who takes data, you know, misrepresents it because I mean, when you think about it, you're not looking at population breakdowns to decide who's supposed to be arrested for what. You're looking at the people who are committing the crimes. You know, uh, that's that's a fact. It's 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 not that like what do you need to stop and like uh, in terms of stop and frisk? Are you going to stop and frisk? Uh, you know, white people when the the crime statistics show that they don't they, it's it's not right. it doesn't mathematically add up bloomberg had had a set of balls on him he would just say yeah then we we're actually stopping and frisking too many whites <laughs> I mean, you got to appreciate the honesty there. It's just, but you know, Bloomberg was that kind of guy. And like the only price you guys had to pay for him keeping the streets clean was he wanted you to drink smaller sodas, I think. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and he only did that because he got around to it, you know? Yeah. I mean, in three terms, you and, and, and the city was already on, the, on its way to being cleaned up. He did more than hold it between the lines, he delegated, you know, to, to his very capable uh, police commissioner. Uh, uh, Greg, not Greg Kelly, but uh, his dad, Ray Kelly, uh, no. who was an excellent uh, police commissioner. And, you know, that's, that's what a guy should do. I mean, you're a billionaire. You don't really know how to run the police department. Of course, that doesn't stop de Blasio from, uh, you know, it yeah. didn't stop him from running the police. And so now, uh, you know, you have a situation where all the shit comes down from City Hall. It all comes through the brass instead of the police taking care of the police, which is the way it should be. That is such like a like an on the nose Bloomberg thing to say. You forget about him sometimes that like he had no social awareness, which was kind of a nice thing. Like he didn't have that that politicians like, oh, maybe he was just kind of a data man. And he would. Yeah, he would say things like. Actually, if you ask me, I think we're stopping far too many whites and we need to be easier on them. Well, I mean, it, it, it technically was true. If, if whites committed 12 percent of the crime, they were stopping and frisking 15 percent whites. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, it's it's too many. I, I, there's something about having 27 billion dollars, which is what he had at the time, I guess, that kind of gives you a certain uh, honesty. Yeah. With people. Right. But then again, when he started to run for president, he pissed all over his legacy, apologized yeah. at, at, at a church, you know, trying to appease the Al Sharptons of the world and the racial grievance industry. Bad move, I thought. It's not going to score you any points with them. It's only going to confirm to them that you're a racist or were. Yeah. And, you know, he saved lives. He saved, I think it's an estimated, but 10,000 Black and brown lives were saved by stop and frisk. They're the ones that suffer the most for having guns out there. Right. And, and, and from what they call gun violence, you know, which is where guns take over and just start <laughs> shooting. And I mean, it's like they, there's no accountability on the criminal end. And I'll give you one more example of that real quick that's happening right now. The MTA says nobody, a lot of people are jumping the turnstile. A lot of people aren't paying because there's zero enforcement. So their solution is to appoint a bunch of uh, really high-level New Yorkers, you know, New York dignitaries, New York uh, distinguished New Yorkers, I believe. Now, of course, they're not going to meet for free, so they're throwing money there. <laughs> and then what they probably will suggest is making the turnstiles harder to jump, physically <laughs> harder to get through. So you think about all the, I mean, there's hundreds, I guess, of, of, of stations in New York City, hundreds. Yeah. yeah. And and, and, and and thousands of turnstiles, and they want to change those to make them harder to get, instead of just enforcing the laws that are on the books, because enforcement is racist, yeah, but just okay. preventing them from walking through for free is not. And they're losing $500 million a year on people jumping the turnstile, which is about 20% 
uh, yeah, it's about 20% of their uh, budget shortfall. Yeah. I, I tell you, it's it gets to this point where you talk about like, oh, New York has the playbook and you start to go, oh, they could do this. They could do that. Do you get to that? I get to this whenever we talk about like crime and all these cities that are ex experiencing this increase. And it's almost like with the policies, it's almost designed that way. Do you get to that point where you're like, what the fuck am I talking about this for? This is just going to keep getting worse. Like, what? why am I sitting here having hope and going, like, maybe they'll do this? Like, do you just feel like an asshole sometimes? Like, why Why am I even considering the possibility that this could get better? You know, if I took any of it seriously, I would probably feel that way. I, I, I'm the New York Post with jokes. Yeah. I'm not, I, I'm highly irreverent on this stuff because, and people used to ask me, are you like, does it, kind of change your your attitude or your sense of well-being or something or that you get desensitized to this stuff from reading about it and talking about it all the time i was every bit as sensitive about it when i first started reading it as i am now and vice versa i just i've never cared i read something in in a story i don't have empathy particularly for for somebody i don't know i mean like right. you have that standard amount of empathy that you can voice and everything but it's a comic book it's like and, and it is real of course it's real it happens and you know you, but like jesus christ you know you can't take it seriously they've literally like you said designed cities right now to up crime and to make people feel less safe and i think that is just to attack what they think of as white privilege because part of white privilege is just the right to safety right yeah feeling yeah. safe walking down the street they think that's a privileged attitude. You shouldn't get to feel that way because people here don't get to feel that way. So instead of fixing over there, they want to make they want to you know equalize it in the the easiest way possible, which is to just make the law nothing yeah. anywhere, and it's not. And they they can't enforce the law properly. They've put the handcuffs on cops in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, they can't even touch them in certain ways. You can't put a knee in a guy's back. Right. You may go to jail, lose everything that you ever had, lose your pension if you enforce the law the way that you were taught. Yeah. No. For guys who have been doing it for a long time, you know, man, you're going to cost you're going to cost lives, you know. You're going to uh, cops are going to get killed because they can't do what they're there to do. Oh, for sure. So <laughs> don't it's not even almost set up that way. It is definitely set up that way with bail reform. People go in, they come out. You have a couple of thousand people in the city, a couple of thousand God. in New York City, a city of nearly nine million people. You have about 2000 people that if you lock them up, if you took them out of the picture, the crime situation would change dramatically. Yeah, you're They're right. Not willing to do that, of you're course, you know, because that's somehow racist yeah you're right it has to be set up because if you can see the answer right in front of you and you don't do it then you are kind of de facto just doing you're, you're purposely doing it uh this way i had no idea that asking about the new york city crime report we dive all the way into uh, the absolute shit of new york and every other big city in the country but here we are we went we, we went to that place i did want to uh, ask you about a couple more things while we still have you here um, number one, we, we talked about uh, the Kumia days. You did make me curious about something. Um, I didn't want to get too into the weeds and gossipy, but you did mention it wasn't Anthony, it was management. May I ask you, since you were there, what happened with Keith the cop? Oh, um, well, and, and first, can I, I, I want to just put a button on everything that you just said there. Oh, sure. Uh, a lot of people see New York City crime and they go, or New York City crime where they go, why do I care about New York? F fuck New York. But... It's it is uh yeah it's it's coming soon to a city near you right it's 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 the model that is is going out and it's one of the models and it's certainly an interesting show and it's a funny show and crime is crime everywhere crime in New York City is is pretty damn interesting uh, I you know have covered crime all over the country and, and still do look at that stuff and and I have some live streams about that which which come up on on locals on my locals uh, channel but uh, to your point. Um, uh, to your question, rather, about Keith the cop. I, what happened with him? He was there, and he was there every day, and then he wasn't. And uh, I think that he uh, is not involved public. He's certainly not involved publicly anymore with Compound, and I, uh, I'm not sure of his private. 
you know, you, one thing about compound, it's about as opaque as you can get when it comes to stuff like that. They oh, okay. they don't share numbers uh, with the hosts. They don't. They, there's a lot that they don't tell you until they want you to know. Yeah. And so, <laughs> I, basically, my feeling was this is just a theory, but I think you know, E Rock. If you're aware of E Rock, sure. I think he was kind of that would take the de facto actions that that Keith, you know, Keith would. He was sort of he was sort of like a, you know, basically. I mean, like <laughs> Keith hired him, and then after a few weeks, he didn't see Keith no more. So it's, okay. it seemed like that's you know, like E Rock basically is Keith. Yeah, E Rock. Keith, I haven't seen, heard, heard from, talked to, nothing in. You know, since you have. Yeah. I Iraq is kind of more qualified for that kind of thing. If people know about the Opie and Anthony days and stuff like that, that's just it's kind of more up his alley. I know I'm, I'm going too deep into the weeds here as a guy who was a, a subscriber in the early days of Compound. Um, I know that Keith caught a lot of shit for losing Legion of Skanks, but I feel like I, I don't know. And, and I, I was one of them at the time. But that show was kind of heading in that direction anyway, was it? Or is there something they could have done to maybe keep those guys? I think there was a lot that could have been done to keep them. They left. There was a lot that they could have done to keep working with them and and a, a growing relationship, you know, between the two could have happened. I mean, the one criticism that I have of Compound is that it's run by a legend, Anthony Cumia, who is about the funniest guy that I've ever hung out with and and a total professional. I mean, but he's there to do a show. He's, he's as far as running a network goes, I mean, he's he's a legend already. I mean, how hungry is a, is is a legend? Right. Uh you know, he's still doing great work, but he's not, you know, I mean, he has his audience and like you know, there's younger people there who are you know, they're I guess what you would call um not motivation, but their their drive, you know, whatever is is not always you know fed properly by management, and that's not really Ann's job. Ann is very supportive of, of everything everybody's doing, but then the people who actually you know turn the turn the knobs and and, and the levers or or whatever, you know, wh whoever is in charge of of promoting people to a different thing, or I don't know, if they had somebody there developing talent, it would help. Yeah, and if they had somebody there, and but you know, talent is left there to develop as it will. And in terms of bringing people in, you know, that's another thing. I mean, there, there's a couple of issues like that. Yeah. But it, it's you can't expect the man to do it all. I mean, he's he's just there doing a great show four days a week. Right. Uh, I, I will say, E Rock, you know, nice guy, personable. You can't not like him to talk to him. Pretty much, he it came through for me on a couple of key things at a, at a couple of times generally speaking doesn't do shit that i can see <laughs> oh i mean just he's just <laughs> i when i was there i mean i i seldom saw him i mean he he was there for a little while then he had a kid and then like that was just, he just it seems like he just punched out you know yeah but, i can see that i can see that well and anthony said numerous times publicly he said i don't want to be the boss like he's, right. he said, I, I, I have I want to do my show. I want to do it, uh, you know, with with no strings attached, no censorship, whatever. And you can tell he's always wanted someone else to kind of take that that leadership role. And um, that, that kind of brings us to you now uh, being at censored TV. Uh, and also, yes, check out, uh, I, I, it's not I believe it's NYC crime report dot locals dot com. So you've got both of those. NYCCrimereport.locals.com. We'll put these all in the description. And uh, oh, also censored.tv, which I, I heard on uh, Gavin's show. I was listening for some of the Owen Benjamin Gavin gossip, and I heard <laughs> that uh, you were you were bringing quite a few people to that, uh, that platform, so that was nice to hear. But um, kind of the in-between, there was that, that incident with Gino, which has been talked about to death over and over. We don't need... I, I will say, I, I will say as someone who is 100% on your side... If you look at the scoreboard, that guy has run more people out of that network than you've punched in the face. So I thought that was unfair that you had to go. <laughs> yeah, I would have liked to have stayed. And I, I would have gotten to stay. But Gino decided uh, that, you know, four days after it happened, it was Thursday. Uh, and it happened on a Monday. So it was like, I don't know, June 24th or whatever the fuck. But I guess who was on the show? Kevin Brennan, Bob Levy. 
Richie Redding. They were all talking to Ant. Ant it was tired of being so fucking serious. They start talking. They start laughing. It was one of the best episodes, and it was the best episode of the, of the week for sure, and maybe you know, maybe the best for a while because there was this cathartic sense that like okay it's gonna be all right we're moving on we're laughing about this now no big thing well i think gino saw that and said oh no no we're not doing that this is this is serious this is a serious thing i broke my jaw i don't think his jaw was broken uh this is so bad that it, it just reeled all that fun back in and then it became serious again. And then it was this whole thing and everybody just accepted what he said, you know, it seemed without any sort of evidence of it. I mean, like, and then he wanted me fired is, is all it was. Yeah. He wanted me to be fired for doing it. So, you know, he made it sound as if like, look, this is pretty high stakes, you know, there's consequences here. And then uh, of course, you know, it, they fire me the Wednesday. I'm, I'm supposed to be coming back. I think that he came back the following Monday. Yeah. So he came back immediately. Gino with, did. With his as broken soon jaw. as I was fired, he was back. <laughs> he was miraculously healed. <laughs> yeah, I, it was, he got really cunty about it. And, and not only that, it, it did surprise me. I, like you said, uh, now that you refresh the timeline, I was definitely thinking, oh, Pat's going to be back easy because – you had that interview uh, where Kevin Brennan on his show confronted an obviously drunk and late and disheveled Gino. You had Aaron Berg telling him live on air, like, look, you drink too much. You drop the end bomb too much. I fuck, I'm your friend and I can't fucking be associated with you. Then you had you being fed up with his horse shit. And like with all these people in Anthony's ear, you would think that they'd go, he'd go, oh yeah, Pat's going to be fine. He's good. I just, yeah, I can't believe that that whining and whinging and cuntiness actually worked. That disappointed me. Yeah, I was disappointed too, obviously, because I, I really liked being a compound. I didn't want to go. I was, I, by the time I got fired, I was sort of like, you know what? There, there, it, it, all this talk has happened and everything. Of course, now it just continues. That's the weird thing. Yeah. Uh, Gino makes up this idea that like, uh, oh, yes, he fled the city to avoid being arrested. <laughs> I was in the city 40 days after punching him. Yeah. You know, 40, 40, 41 days. Yeah. I wasn't in any big hurry. I don't have the money to pay rent without my fucking job. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. It's expensive in Manhattan, so I had to fucking get out of the city for a bit and figure out my next you yeah. know, move. It's not really that complicated, but he makes it sound like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm a wanted man. You know? and, he, yeah. and he makes it sound like I, oh, I, I ran out on, uh, I, on rent that fucked over my... Uh, I made an arrangement with my landlord. It was all good. He accepted what I gave him, and you know, I, we went our separate ways. Yeah. And I, my ex-wife has nothing to do with the lease. I didn't fuck over this girl that they... You know, I don't even want to go into... No, 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 you don't whatever, have to. Yeah. It's so stupid. And you know what? Punching somebody, probably, generally speaking, not something that you should do. Uh, it certainly wasn't. It's not something that I've made a habit of. I, I think Gino is the only person I've punched as an adult. Yeah, dude, I, so, I dealt with him. I dealt with him for two days, and it's like the lack of ability for him to insult anyone, and the like his stunning ability to not be able to be for talk shit just really kind of disarmed me in a weird way. And dealing with him for two days and his whinging made me realize I'm like, I, I get it now. I get what all these comedians I uh, who that I follow. I get what they've been saying about this fucking guy. It's I I mean it's it's like dealing with a thirteen year old. It's fucking remarkable. He's a very very hurt and angry, insecure uh, man. You know he's very hurt, yeah. and he should be pitied because he's he's just hurt. But you cannot have any empathy or sympathy for a guy who acts the way he does. It's yeah. he's wildly uh, unchecked. Hey, it just he's so accustomed to saying whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah. But he and, and that's great if you have anything to say that's of any value. Yeah, it's it's but, it's like know. a less successful stuttering John. I was just on Who Are These Podcasts and I remember <laughs> telling Carl, I go, Carl, I'm st- it's in a weird way, I'm starting to almost feel bad for John. And Carl goes, Fuck you, don't stop that right now. And I went, you know what? You're right. I get that same vibe with Gino where I'm like, this insecure 
like delusional fucking guy. Like I almost feel bad. And then something in the back of your head goes, he's a fucking asshole. Don't, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, it comes out in actions when you have an ego like that, that you have to feed constantly and talk about how right you are and have yeah. everybody, you know, you want everybody shitting on your enemies. And it's like, it's it's ridiculous. It's a he's a ridiculous person, yeah. and that's why even though I can't say that punching people was the right thing to do, obviously, I don't. You know, I mean, like wait, violence, not good. We get it, right? Yeah. But I don't regret it. I mean, I fuck it. it it's it fuck. was it's what had to happen, and I I'm fine with it. Um, you you mentioned this, and, and I had actually kind of forgotten about it. Um, we actually watched it on on our show one night because uh, somebody was in the chat going, "Did you hear this just happened over on?" Because when we do our evening show, uh, Kyle from Unique Entertainment is on, and we've we've interviewed him before on this channel. And uh, you 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 asked me, you "Go, did you hear my thing with Unique?" And my eyes lit up, and I went, "Oh yeah, that was fucking bizarre." So you you were talking to Kyle, and I think he was in the bag a little bit. And he started, again, asking you about the fucking punch. And, um, like, he just kind of kept going. And you find what, what happened? Did you just kind of finally go, okay, I'm not fucking talking to this idiot anymore. I'm hanging up. Well, I just realized that, that he was drunk. And, and the, with that drunkenness came, like, a kind of hostility. And I didn't, I mean, look, somebody had tried to prepare me. They said, like, this is kind of like what he normally does. And they sent a link. Well, the link went to a YouTube channel that was taken down. And I know he's, he goes, I guess, on, you know, there's another location for whatever. But I was like, ah, what the fuck? It'll be fine. So, I, get, I mean, because I wasn't aware of him at all, really. I mean, I just knew him from, like, I guess, Twitter or whatever, Joe Exotic. But, look, I mean, I got nothing bad to say about him, except he was just, like, during that interview, he was just really hostile. You yeah. know, he was like, uh, he, he's calling it a sucker punch, which I don't I don't like. It's not a sucker punch. Guy is watching me walk up, and he knows that I'm pissed off. And, you know, he's speaking to me. A sucker punch is punching somebody in the back of the fucking head or from behind or from the side. They don't see it coming. So I took exception to that, and he really stuck to his guns. And then he's like, and you put all your power into it. And he just, I just, you know, and you didn't knock him out. You should have knocked him <laughs> out cold, you know, like basically insulting my punching power. Like your Deontay I mean, Wilder you know, I've or I've never something, punched yeah. anybody in my life. Yeah. He's, it's still, you don't want to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, wow, this guy's just coming at this from this really hostile point of view. And I don't, I don't have time for that shit. God damn it, Pat. How dare you not be Lennox Lewis? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, I supposedly broke his jaw. Is that not good enough? Right. I mean, uh, if you have a choice between, oh, I knocked him down or he stayed standing and I broke his jaw, I'd rather have the broken jaw because I can break bones with my fist. I can't control that he can stay on his feet. I mean, that and he was yeah. probably shit-faced, so he probably didn't feel it as much. Well, I spun him around and he fell into the bar and stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, he, he did. It's, it's, it's not like he was just like, oh, if I like, just stood there and like no movement at all. I mean, but, but I think, I think what, what did you say, Kyle? Kyle thought I was Kyle. supposed to knock him out with one punch. Yeah, it's like, not, it's, it's not fair. The ropes kept him up. It, yeah. And it doesn't really work that way. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you... It's a standing eight <laughs> count. It's a standing eight count at least. I'm um, not, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not Captain McCluskey from, from the Godfather <laughs> here. You know, I got I thought I thought I threw all you guinea hoods out of here. Um, so anyway, uh, that brings us to to Gavin and Censored TV. I, I tell you, you know, it it sucks losing that gig and everything because you know Compound seemed like a great place creatively, but you fell into a, a nice deal here with Gavin. And I I have a conspiracy theory. I can throw it to you now since you're here. My theory is, I honestly believe, and I have nothing to back this up, that uh, Anthony felt bad he felt almost pressured into having to do what he did do you did he put in a good word with gavin or do you guys just have a really good relationship and gavin saw you become a free agent and said guy fuck it. i'm getting pat no questions asked <laughs> well both really because i've known gavin for you know years i'm a, and I, i'm a fan i'm a huge fan of gavin i've always said that and you know, Gavin was listening to New York City Crime Report. I didn't know this until recently. He was listening to New York City Crime Report back in 2012. He got it recommended by, wow. um, you know, a guy that he knew. So and he actually said, I might not even be doing podcasting, you know, if it wasn't for New York City Crime Report. So, yeah, we go back. But, I mean, we go back in that way, but we've only, we knew each other from like 2015. Uh but also, I did have to get Ant's blessing on it because, you know, Gavin, no matter who he's talking about 
getting if if it's going to create any weird bullshit between him and Anthony Cumia, he's not going to do it. Right. So I had to talk to Ant about that and say, listen, uh, how would you feel about you know this if I if I go to censored if I work with Gavin? He was like, absolutely. You know, he's like, yeah. that's. And and I guess they probably I know that they must have talked about it at some point. Yeah. But no, I had to, yeah. It, it 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 and I appreciate that because I mean, Ant is like a, you know, a free market guy. He's not trying yeah. to ruin anybody's living, like right. you know, some people would have happened. Yeah. You know? Well, that and I think he feel, he felt. I do honestly, and I don't know how you feel about it. I felt like he felt pressured into doing what he did. I I don't think. I think if you got to sit him down and assure him that none of this would leave the room, I think he'd say, "I didn't want to see Pat go." Well, he was pressured. I mean, it's a fact. It's it's it. it he, there were there was pressure there. He he, all things being equal, he's fine with a punch. At Sullivan's, he didn't yeah. even see it, literally see it happen. I mean, he, he was in the room. He didn't see it. Yeah. And that was in the and the video uncovered that. But like. He didn't want to fire me at all. He told me that when he fired me, he didn't want yeah. to fire me. Like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> well, <laughs> but he goes, it's it's there, there's certain, you know, certain uh, factors here that I, you know, I think he was just concerned about legal aspects of it. And yeah. obviously. You know, Gino was in control of that, so that's where the pressure came from. Yeah. Period. Well, I, look, man, I think censored TV is a is a great landing space. From that, I mean, you get to work. You you go from working with Anthony to working with Gavin, who might give less of a fuck what you say than Anthony does, and that's hard to do. Yeah, <laughs> I think they both give about the same amount of fucks yeah. as to what I say. Uh, then and now, Gavin's great, and, and I'm so happy to be a censored TV because it's it's just a new, it's 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 really even though there's some crossover with the audience and and it, it's still a new audience. You know, it's more people still who yeah. won't be familiar with what I do, and it's that that's exciting. Gavin is the greatest. He's just, I I mean, like I meant it. Everything he says turn everything he does seems to turn to gold. You know, from Vice to Proud Boys to now censored TV. He's, I, I don't think that he's ever drawn a non-entertaining breath, meaning like he's, he's entertaining regardless of what he does. So I'm, I'm a big fan of him as a businessman and, and as a performer. His stand-up needs work because he, <laughs> he likes to take his dick out on stage. Right. You know, he doesn't realize that that's, that, that is strictly off limits. Yeah. Uh, you know, this isn't Montreal after all. But, uh, yeah, thanks for that. I, I appreciate it. I'm very happy to be there. No, you're a great fit for that. And, uh, again, Pat Dixon, uh, nyccrimereport.locals.com. And, again, censored.tv and uh, at Pat Dixon on Twitter. All of this stuff is going to be in the description right below the video here, so you guys can click on all of that. Uh, go go to his locals. Go subscribe to uh, censored.tv. Follow Pat on Twitter, the whole deal. Very funny. New York City Crime Report. Uh, we kind of we kind of got into it right away, so I didn't have time to tell you. It's one of the most unique. Like, if you feel like you watch podcasts that are like, oh, it's kind of the same, built around the same theme, and I'm kind of watching a lot of the same shit. New York City Crime Report, and I think you would agree, Pat, is one of the most unique podcasts out there. There's not really many in that kind of genre in comedy. Well, my God, thank you. It's it's the only true crime comedy podcast uh, <laughs> de de devoted to New York City crime anyway. And yeah, thanks for, for saying that, because a lot of times people think a true crime podcast, they're thinking cliffhangers and like music and you have to like, oh, shit, care, you know, about right. how bad it is and everything. It's like, no, it's not like that. This is just like a, a really irreverent survey through crime. And that's, you know, my stand up is very irreverent too. still doing a lot of stand up. In fact, I'll be at Comedy Cove in Springfield, New Jersey this week, okay. the 9th and 10th with Felicia Gillespie, who's also very funny. In fact, she's the, the woman that I punched Gino over so uh, <laughs> we <laughs> now we're, well, she, we're she obviously be, uh, didn't mind that too much then <laughs> no <laughs> she was apparently all in favor of it yeah. and uh, has been very supportive yeah she's great so that's the ninth and the tenth at the comedy cove all right well very cool well hey Pat thanks for taking uh, all this time for us man I really appreciate it like I said um, I, I got introduced to uh, New York City crime report when you were on uh, uh, when you started on compound there in the early days and it's really been uh, just a really fun show to follow. So uh, uh, continued success on Uncensored. Thanks very much for having me anytime. All right. Thank you, Pat. Pat Dixon, everybody.